commencing on Radio Mirmiri, Monday at 7 p.m. New weekly English language program, Globalize. Presenting current events from home and abroad, including background contributions and interviews. Our aim here at Radio Murmuray will be to provide information and opinion. I'm Peter Tobin, and I will be here Monday night, 7 p.m. Radio Murmuray, Global Eye. Welcome to tonight's Global Eye. I'm Peter Tobin. On tonight's program, we will be dealing with the West's anti-Syria strategy and the State Restructuring Committee's report for Nepal. The West and Syria... Russia and China's Security Council veto on an anti-Syrian motion has for the present forestalled an attempt by the United States, Europe and pro-Western Arab states to pave the way for regime change and probable military intervention. The move for sanctions and condemnation runs parallel with findings of a UN commission alleging that over 6,000 Syrians have died at the hands of security forces and concludes by calling for a comprehensive arms embargo. These take place against the backdrop of a sustained propaganda campaign in the Western media, attacking the Syrian government on the grounds of its, quote, human rights record, calling for the resignation of President Assad and the end of one party, Ba'athist rule. As communists and progressives know, human rights are selectively employed by Western imperialists to justify aggression intervention or inv invasion against states that are seen as hostile to Western capitalist interests. Why then is Syria singled out? Syria was among the number of nations in this oil-rich nations carved out of the ruins of the Ottoman Empire following its defeat in the 1918 war, which led to English and French colonization in the region. As everywhere, there were indigenous anti-colonial resistance movements, and in Syria they took the shape of Baathism. Baathism means rebirth in Arabic. It advocated socialism with Arab characteristics and as such competed with and rejected European socialism and indeed communism. What also marked its rise, both in Syria and Iraq, was that its effective cadre was drawn from the military officer caste. Thus the two parties came to power in each country by military coups and began the task of socialising their economies, nationalising their oil resources and using the proceeds to fund health, education and welfare services. They were also ruthless in creating secular societies, particularly emancipating women from the brutal chauvinist yoke of extreme Islamism. Their refusal to bow down before United States and Western imperialism would have put such a regime on the hit list in all events. But what ensured it was that Syria, along with Iraq and Iran, gave complete commitment to the Palestinian cause and the defeat of Israel, the Western colonial cancer placed in the heart of the Arab nation. Along with its Arab neighbours, Syria has fought several wars with, but has never surrendered to the massive American-created Israeli war machine. During the 1970s and 80s, it funded and sheltered many of the Palesti Palestinian liberation groups that emerged, which the West referred to as terrorists, as indeed they referred to the Maobadi here in Nepal. Only Syria and Iran, as coherent nation-states, remain in determined opposition to Israel and the aims of Western imperialism, and have come together to support the two most effective Arab liberation groups, Hamas, the Sunni organization in the huge Gaza Strip and Hezbollah, the Shiite resistance in Lebanon. The opposition. <clears throat> the dissidents confronting Assad's government, as in Tunisia, Libya and Egypt, are predominantly a mixed bag of westernized, petty bourgeois middle strata and extreme Islamists. The first group has a general significance as they represent something that is sometimes underestimated by revolutionary communists. That is an indigenous strata that has been psychologically colonized by Western ideology and lifestyles. The other substantial block is the Islamists, who loathe secular Ba'athism. Hence, the Saudi Arabian Sunni Salafist regime of feudal absolutists are among the most vociferous Arab opponents of this Ba'athist government. They find their voice through the Arab League, which is a pro-Western collection of quizzling Arab states including Turkey and Jordan, and which is as determined as America and Europe to see regime change. 
Conclusion. Where communists are not yet a significant presence, we see forces with whom we have serious ideological and political differences, but support when they become victims of imperialist aggression. In this situation, we raise the slogan, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Therefore, if Iran is attacked, or the overthrow of the Syrian government is attempted by Westing, Western hirelings and dupes, then all progressives, all communists, should rally to its support, specifically by demonstrating here in Kathmandu, outside the United States, European and Israeli embassies. It is absolutely imperative that Western stratagems in the Middle East are defeated. If Syria and Iran fall, it will be a triumph for imperialism, and aside from the damage it will do to those countries, as seen in the wanton destruction of Iraq, will be an enormous setback for the Palestinian cause. But Islamism, Islamism and Ba'athism have proved cul-de-sacs, and it is now clear that only people's war will lead to freedom for all peoples. And to paraphrase Marx, mark the end of prehistory and the beginning proper of human history. The State Restructuring Committee has delivered its report on the proposed constitution for New Nepal. Predictably, the committee has split on party lines between federalists and centralists, with the United Communist Party of Nepal Maoist in the former camp and Nepali Congress and the UML in the latter. The federalist majority on the committee produced an 11-province model which attempts to address the long-standing grievances of the ethnic and dispossessed peoples of the countryside, 80% of the Nepalese population in a predominantly agricultural society. This model therefore assigns priority rights to the dominant ethnic groups in these rural areas comprising new provincial states, 10 for Janjatis and a non-territorial state for Dalits. This itself is a revision of the original demand for a 14 model system and has produced some anger among Tarus, for example, who compromise 10% of the population and nearly 15% in the Terai and feel their aspirations have not been addressed. Similarly, some Madeshi groups have complained about the Terai being split into two states, which they contend does not reflect the unitary nature of the terrain and its peoples. Also, the Maobadi Beri Kanali National Liberation Front has taken exception to, to the proposed single state for Kanali Kapted, as it does not address the demands of the Kanali people. These are serious points and demonstrate the difficulty in meeting all the long pent-up grievances of the oppressed and suppressed Janjati and Dalit peoples. However, they do not detract from the federalist thrust of the majority's report. The minority report suggests a six-state model with only two addressing the question of ethnic representation and four of economic viability. It also tramples across the claim for Janjati cultural and identity recognition, appearing to draw vertical lines through Nepal, which even contradicts its horizontal three-banded topography. One is clearly an attempt to create, to create a genuine federal structure, whatever its problems, the other, an attempt to continue the centralist model that has dominated Nepal for its last two centuries. The centralized model was anomalous for Nepal because it vested power in the center, who are largely located in the urban centers, particularly Kathmandu. With this setup, the Jandartis, Landless and the Dalits were oppressed not only economically, but culturally and linguistically. The arrogance of the center was summed up in the old Panchayat slogan, one country, one religion, one language. In a social formation with over 70 linguistic groups, with diverse and strong cultures, this was always a kettle that would sooner or later boil over. That is what happened during the People's War. And under the dual power of people's government, many of these wrongs began to be rectified. The centralists argue that federalism, by making too many concessions to diversity, will undermine the unity of the state. There was a particularly informative article by the historian R.K. Raj Kunwa recently, which rightly celebrated the heroism and patriotism of Bir Bil Badra Kunwa at the Battle of Nalapani in 1814 against the British. But R.K. asserts in the conclusion of this article that Bal Badra and other great figures from Priti Narayan Shah to Bimson Tapa, who forged Nepal into a single nation, would be horrified to see the country broken into small pieces 
by imposing a federal system. I think he is wrong, as I am not convinced that these great nation makers would have supported the latter authoritarian, centralized, casteist Rana state, epitomized by the Maluki Ain of 1854, which among other regressive statutes gave Brahmins practically the right to murder with impunity. The fact that the People's War allowed 80% of the population to take advantage of a hitherto unknown freedom from state and caste terror proves that, to paraphrase the Irish poet Yeats, the centre could not hold. If only on economic terms the case for federalism is unanswerable. Consider, Kathmandu is responsible for 42% of the total revenue of Nepal and that out of the 75 districts, only 12 of them generate a staggering 94% of total, total national revenue, with a mere 6% left for the remaining 63. The only way, therefore, to redress the imbalance of centuries in a, is a federal structure where, for the first time, all Nepalese will be equal. Divesting powers of law and order, media, transportation, partial revenue connection, housing, tourism, health and agricultural policy from the centre to the provinces will only strengthen the bonds between the many peoples of this great and promising country. That is the only real guarantee for unity in a new Nepal. The status quo is not an option. It is a recipe for further accelerated decline, as has been amply demonstrated by the recent history of feudalism and the total failure of over 50 years of free market capitalism that have reduced this country to decay and anarchy. Federalism, for all its difficulties, is both a cry for historical justice and the only practical way forward for a new Nepal. That's the end of Global Eye for tonight, here on Radio Murmuray. Thank you for listening, and I'd just like to close by thanking the team that helped put this program together. Divakar, our librarian, Kishar, our stand-in technician, and Prajwal, our producer. Thank you and good night. Thank you.